I don't know how many people know, but I'm actually an alumni of the Olds Agricultural College. Uh, before I started my uh, archaeology career, my family thought that I should have a, a fallback position, so I did attend Olds for uh, a little while. So it's really interesting to be back here at this time. Um, when Brian asked me to do this paper, I, I was a little bit hesitant because I feel like I, I know a lot about my own experience with bison kill sites, but I don't really know a lot about what everybody else has been doing. So I kind of hemmed and hawed, and he said, no, no, that's fine. You can just talk about what you know about. So that's actually what I'm going to do. Uh, I, I can't do a, a, a broad sweeping uh, discussion, but I'm, I'll talk about what I know. Um, and like Alwyn, I think my career is exactly the same time period. It's not quite 40 years. It's maybe 38 or 39, something like that. Okay, so when I started my studies uh, at the University of Calgary in the fall of 1976, Plains archaeology was taught by the two recognized experts in the field, Dick Forbes and Barney Reeves. Although both scholars had done many different kinds of research, their work at the time, to me at least, um, was really defined by the two major buffalo jumps that they had excavated, Old Women's and Head Smashed In. Uh, both of these sites were multi-component communal kills, spots where people returned again and again, resulting in massive bone beds. And it's hard to underestimate the significance of these sites to our understanding of Northern Plains prehistory. Uh, Dick had done his classic seriation of Old Women's projectile points, and the lithic technology was definitely his major focus. Um, he, I, was, I have here, he did very little analysis of the bison bones, but as Jerry pointed out this morning, they actually threw them out uh, because they were considered to be just matrix. I mean, the points were there in this matrix, which included a lot of bone, um, sort of how we do with fire broken rock today. Um, by the time that Barney uh, had dug it head smashed in, uh, there was a little bit more interest in the bones, of course. Uh, and, um, and Barney took a lot of interest in the fauna and he actually taught courses in faunal analysis at the University of Calgary, which I was lucky enough to take uh, in the 1970s. And we were given real bone from head smashed in to analyze. And this was really, really exciting. It's hard to uh, emphasize how much the chance to work with archaeological materials can really capture uh, students' interests. So Barney taught us um, the state of the art techniques in faunal analysis in those days. Uh, he taught us how to do sex analysis on the phalanges and metapodials of bison, um, how to analyze bison teeth to determine the season of death. Um, so people like Rare and Frison had pioneered these and we learned these techniques, um, Bedord and Duffield on sexing, and things like how to calculate the MNI, the minimum number of individuals required to account for the bones in our assemblages. We did all of those calculations, of course, in those days with pencil and paper. Uh, and you did learn to be very accurate in counting, recording, cataloging, and making your columns add up on your tables and graphs, because uh, they were all done by hand. So um, it's quite different. Um, I was lucky enough to take my field school in the Crow's Nest Pass from Barney, and uh, Margaret Kennedy was the teaching assistant. Uh, if you told me then that 40 years later <laughs> we would still be knowing each other and, and working as colleagues, I would never have believed it. Um, the site that I, that I did my field school at was the Maple Leaf site, and it was a really fascinating small-scale bison kill in the Rocky Mountains, uh, where the bison were killed adjacent to or even mired in a small spring. Uh, I don't have any slides, unfortunately. I should have gotten some from you. Um, a site with good preservation, good stratigraphy, uh, nice projectile points. And that's when I really became hooked on archaeology. And so a few years later, when I applied for grad school to do my master's, I determined to analyze the bone from the site. Uh, looking back on it, the 1980s uh, was a bit of a golden age for faunal analysis in Alberta. Faunal analysis had become a very hot topic for the processual archaeologists at the time. Um, there was people like George Frisland and American scholars publishing on major bison kills. Uh, Binford's classic Nunamute archaeology had been published. and. Uh, just blew a number of us away with the research avenues that had opened. Um, Jack Brink and Bob Daw and their colleagues at the Archaeological Survey were beginning to excavate the campsite area that had smashed in. Mike Wilson was doing a lot of fa faunal work and many, many of my fellow graduate students were focusing on faunal analysis. Uh, so it was kind of like the sexy research topic of the 1980s. Uh, we were starting to understand processes of taphonomic change, uh, how natural deterioration and carnivore damage and the differing density of bone could affect our record. John Brumley had developed a manual for the scientific cataloging of bison bones that um, 
was, was used very much uh, in the University of Calgary uh, in those days. And it actually meshed pretty well with Binfordian analysis. Uh, there was a young fellow named Dale Waldy who had developed a new statistical technique for sexing bison bones using discriminant function analysis, which was really awesome. And I'll never forget calculating away uh, in my office with my pencil and paper using your formulas. And uh, my office mate came in and he said, hey, have you ever heard of this thing? And he was holding this device in his hand and he goes, it's a programmable calculator. <laughs> a pro and I, I was like, programmable, like what does that mean? And he says, you can punch these formulas in and you can do it much faster. And so uh, it was very, very exciting. On that basis, I ended up booking some time on the mainframe computer at the University of Calgary to do my analysis. And I had these big tapes and I would go down to the basement and get my tapes loaded onto the machine. Um, and two days later, I would get my printout, and it was very, very exciting times indeed. Uh, we felt like we had the power of the gods at our fingertips uh, to, to have those, those computers. And of course, everybody's iPhone is more powerful than those computers were today, but uh, it was still, it was a very exciting time. Um, so when I finished my master's degree in the, um, the, the faunal analysis of the site in the Crow's Nest Pass, I was pretty chuffed. And I can remember talking to Brian Vivian in the field one day, uh, as you do, and Brian congratulated me on getting my um, master's and asked what I wanted to do next. What was I going to do? Um, what would my idea of a great scientific achievement be? And he said, do you want to go and get your PhD? And I said, oh, no, no, no. <laughs> master's was enough. I don't want to do that. But what I would like to do is dig a buffalo jump. So just like my idols, Dick and Barney had done, I would, I would really appreciate the chance to dig a buffalo jump. Now that's probably me and uh, Brian having this very conversation. <laughs> and I think, Brian, that answers your question about whether I'm Tweed or Mackinac. <laughs> what is he? <laughs> I think he's as confused, uh, perhaps, as I am uh, at times. OK, so in that conversation, you can imagine me saying, I'd like to dig a buffalo jump. And so do you know that phrase, be careful what you ask for? Uh, between 1988 and 1990, I excavated 21 different kill sites in the Old Man River Dam project area including three buffalo jumps, and was responsible for analyzing hundreds upon hundreds upon hundreds of thousands of buffalo bones. Uh, it was certainly the most exhilarating and fascinating time of my life as a professional archaeologist, although it was a bit of a blur since it was my uh, very first permit uh, uh, to be doing that work. So uh, sometimes I find it hard when people today say we're not getting enough mentoring uh, when things have changed so much over the years, but uh, there you go. What made the bison kill sites at the Old Man River Dam so absolutely intriguing was that using the analytical tools that had been developed um, by the 1980s, by the late 1980s, we were able to look at certain bone beds. And it wasn't just a bunch of bones. Uh, it was telling you stories about uh, why the bones were there. And a bone bed like this and a bone bed like this might tell you two completely different stories. Um, by this time, of course, Apple had come out with the desktop computer, uh, and uh, we decided that we would use these in the Old Man Dam uh, project. Uh, we used Macintosh computers. John Brumley was the project manager, and he had requested that we use his faunal system, which we were all very happy to do. Um, and it allowed us to do some of this modeling, which we really, really enjoyed, or I really enjoyed. Uh, the power of these Macintoshes was incredible. Uh, what I found was that I could um, check that there was ink in the printer and put a ream of paper and before I left for the evening I could push a button and when I got to my own office in the morning the printout would be there. So it was really uh, a, a huge advancement. Uh, so I'm just going to quickly go through um, three of the sites um, before I move ahead to the future of archaeology. Uh, hmm. Okay, so the first site is um, uh, these three buffalo, is the three buffalo jumps that I'm going to focus on. So this is DJPM 80, the Crow's Nest Kill Site. And it was a really um, small constri constricted bone bed just in this area here. And it was at the base of a really spectacular cliff. This cliff is uh, over 100 feet high. 
And so those buffalo weren't uh, getting up when they uh, went over that cliff. Um, it's a very odd uh, kill in the sense that it doesn't really make sense. It's um, uh, facing south rather than north. There's, there was no drive lanes above it. Uh, there was nothing that would really hint at the bone bed there. Uh, and it also scares me to think how easily the site could have been um, missed by our backhoe program. The bone bed was only about 20 meters long by 4 meters wide and reflected a single event that had occurred in the last few hundred years. Um, if we just moved the backhoe over one way or the other, we would have missed the site completely. Uh, the site was so small that I was actually able to dig about 80% of it. So, uh, yeah, the bone bed was literally, oops. Yeah, well, there's from looking down from the top. So you can see it's a very narrow uh, little bone bed. Um, the kinds of analysis that we were doing in those days uh, was looking at the, the kinds of buffalo bones that were present and counting up the maximum or the minimum number of individuals. So let's say you had 20 bison, um, then you should have 80 or 40, sorry, four limbs from that bison. And we would look at the proportion of what had been taken away and what had been left behind in the kills and then try to determine what the reasons were for this. And so you could look at the um, the sex of the bison um, and say, oh well, this time of year perhaps the, the bulls were in poor condition, this time of year the cows were in better condition. Um, you could try to determine if they were perhaps going after marrow or perhaps going after the bones that they could boil up for grease. Uh, perhaps they were going for fresh meat. And so you could look at the proportion of the different types of bone and try to determine what was going on there. Um, this site was very, very strange in the sense that there was no points, and that made sense because it was so steep. But when we looked at the bones, um, there was almost no signs of butchering there. Um, so um, the hyoids, which held the tongue, had been smashed, and there'd been some ribs smashed. Um, one or two of the skulls had been opened through the frontals, which was a bit unusual. Um, but most of the bones were just left there. It was a, an extreme example of what Binford calls a, a, a gourmet strategy. It looks like they had taken the tongues and organs, the, the odd hump was butchered, a rib slab, but most of the bones were just left there. Um, the site really puzzled me, and I offered a few different explanations in my report. Um, I don't know how true it is, but what I settled on was um, uh, the likeliest explanation, it was, had been an example of a kind of a little mini windfall that had happened uh, in the past. Uh, it was a proto-historic age site, um, it was less than 300 years old. Uh, and uh, Peter Fiddler talks about the Pecani young men going out in the winters of 1792 and 1793 on horseback and pursuing small groups of bison and running them over the cliffs quite successfully. So perhaps that would explain this little site. Um, some guys were out having a good time and got an entire small herd of bison and took a little bit of meat, um, but it was too far from camp or unnecessary to go back and get the ladies to do the real work um, of the heavy butchering. So uh, if so, this site is a really interesting little end of an era site. The end of communal bison hunting using traditional jumps was going to become obsolete within a few years. Uh, so it was maybe one of these crossover type sites. Um, the next site initially looks quite similar. It's a sandstone cliff. This is DJPM 126, or the Castle Forks Buffalo Jump. And it also ends in a bone bed. And it's even of similar age, so it's proto-historic. There was one metal point um, and a bunch of stone points in the bone bed. Um, the bone is in a single layer. So you can see it right there um, at the base of the cliff. Uh, but it's much more of a classic buffalo jump. So the jump points to the north and east like a respectable jump should uh, to take advantage of the prevailing winds. And it has a great natural gathering basin behind it. Unfortunately, the field above was cultivated, so there was no way to know if there was drive lanes. Um, now, in terms of the bone bed, um, Yeah, you can see there's a single layer, but it, it was much more spatially extensive. So we were only able to dig a small portion of this one, uh, about 40 or 50 meters. And you can see that most of it had already eroded away. And that was a really fascinating thing uh, about the site. Um, now this site was a complete and utter, 
uh, completely and utterly different from the previous site in the sense that this site showed the most frugal kind of pattern of butcher butchering that I've ever seen. Uh, almost all that was left behind in this kill were the skulls and the necks and the mandibles, the odd rib, but for the most part everything else had been removed. Uh, the skulls had been smashed open, the mandibles pulled apart, the heavier parts of the bone um, were sometimes carted away, even right down to the toes. Uh, so in other words, the ladies that did the butchering at this site uh, were about as frugal as you could be without being Scottish. Uh, <laughs> So this site exhibits a classic example of what Clark Whistler called heavy butchering on the plains. And because it was such a restricted slice of time and it had been covered over so quickly, the pattern was preserved and interpretable. It wasn't a huge jumble of compressed stratigraphy like you normally get in a jump, but uh, very much a snapshot. And this is really interesting in terms of what happens in river valleys. The site was formed, covered over with a, almost a meter of sediment, and then eroded away within, all within about 500 years. Uh, in this area, the old man just whips back and forth, kind of like a cat flicking its tail, and it just boom, 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 and takes out the sites as quickly as they're made, and so it's a, a quite an interesting. Um, when we were doing the Highwood River survey, some, one of the people on the crew asked me, well, why did they have these buffalo jumps that were going right into the river? It doesn't make any sense. And the answer is that the jumps weren't going into the river. The river comes and gets them, and that's, that's uh, really what happens with these sites. And then the last one, uh, chump that we worked at was this my site. Uh, this is a completely different site from the previous two. It was much deeper and older, so it was buried about uh, two meters down, uh, much larger. So the bone bed goes from, say, here all the way out to here, uh, two meters deep. Again, it's the classic. It's north facing. It has a nice natural um, gathering basin behind it. Um, this, the slope isn't all that steep. This is actually an old roadbed. And uh, the steepness of the slope kind of bothered me a little bit uh, in terms of how it would work as a buffalo jump. Um, I think what happened was, in this area, the, the valley is very broad, and the river moves in these nice big S kind of curves, and these S curves slowly migrate down. And when it, um, when the river, leaves one of these curves, it leaves this little notch behind, and then over time it stabilizes and sort of gets all slumpy. And you can look at the old man today and you can see this pattern. You just look and you see the river, the notch, starting to slump and then really slumpy, repeated again and again down the river. And so I think at the time that all this bone was deposited, it looked a lot more like that. So the bison would come over and hit the notch and start to roll. Um, it was used for a very brief period of time, 500 years, uh, from 2,800 years ago to tw uh, 2,300 years ago, and then it just stopped being used. Now, whether that was because this notch became too stabilized and the jump didn't work anymore, or for social reasons, um, that's really a unknown. Um, this site did probably have a corral at the base of it, so almost more like a pound, because we were finding huge numbers of projectile points in the bone bed. You'd find you know, two or three projectile points per square meter. So clearly, they had to kill those bison um, when they were at the bottom. Uh, this is a, a photograph that Margaret Kennedy uh, gave me of Chief Poundmaker's uh, pound, last pound near Lloyd Minster. And you can see the, the sort of the density of bone that you get in one of these bison pounds. And, uh, the Smyce site must have looked very, very much like that with these, these huge mass of uh, bone beds uh, exposed for and used continuously for about 500 years. Uh, just sort of an example there. Um, what we noticed at the Smyce site was um, they were really, it was a very much a production line oriented. So they were taking certain bones to certain areas um, okay, right here, this is where the humeruses and the forelimbs were being processed. There's another area where the hind limbs were being processed, another area where the vertebral columns were. It was very, very much a sort of an assembly line. And it makes sense when you're dealing with, um, you know, the byproducts of hundreds of animals, then you have to have this, uh, this kind of assembly line approach. So uh, different from both of the previous sites. Um, some of the projectile points. I thought I'd better put them in for people that like points. <laughs> um, but just as a last, uh, a last one that I want to talk about, um, 
Did I start late? Did I? Don't worry. <laughs> okay. <Yeah. laughs> um, this is Horseshoe Canyon. Oh, and it's backwards. Is no? <laughs> Something fun. Huh. Anyways, sorry. This is Horseshoe Canyon. Um, and uh, I just want to talk, when I say we dug, dug 21 sites, there was the three big jumps. Um, but this is where the sort of the pressure kind of got to me. Um, Barney, I think, had dug about seven backhoe tests and seven or eight backhoe tests there. And he found bone in every test, so it was clear there had to be something there. Uh, and he suggested more backhoe testing. Um, Stan Van Dyke of Bison Historical had a really nice Pelican Lake campsite up on that island as we called it, and John Brumley had noticed all kinds of drive lanes um, above and leading into Horseshoe Canyon, so there had to be something big there. So I had to do backhoe testing, and I think I did 26 backhoe tests and did not find the kill. And so the pressure was really on. It was like, what is the matter with this girl? She did not find the kill. There clearly has to be something there. Um, I, I, in every single one of these backhoe tests, so they would go down three or four meters, you, there was multiple levels of bison bone. So there'd be um, a soil and then two or three bones, a soil, two or three bones, a soil, two or three bones, um, in every single test. And so um, I picked the three best areas and expanded my blocks and did a little bit of digging there. But essentially, when the more I dug, the more I found, no, that's what's here. You can dig down and you can find the remains of one or two bison. Sometimes there'll be a flake, sometimes there'll be a cut mark, but essentially that's it. There was no concentrations for me to go after. There was no kill. Um, the very bottom of, the, of the, the basal sediment was only a thousand years old. And so the river had come in and scoured out everything uh, and had left a, a, an environment where it was depositing for a thousand years. Um, now, Jack, you did this to me. Uh, I know math is difficult, <laughs> but <laughs> if you do the math <laughs> and you look at those 23 backhoe tests that I dug and you look at these layers of bison bone, you know, one or two bison here, one or two bison there, if you do the math, there's probably 15,000 bison in Horseshoe Canyon, or there were before it was flooded. Uh, and so out of those 15,000 bison, and that's over a thousand years, um, only a thousand years. If even a third of those were killed by people, you know, that's like 5,000 bison. So if you take that for a thousand years, five or six bison a year are being killed in Horseshoe Canyon. And it's just, it's just the normal kind of hunting that you would expect. So that's, that's the normal kind of hunting that was done on the plains. People killed bison. Guys would go out every day hunting bison. And it's just very unusual to find the evidence for it because Usually on the plains, the bison bones disappear. It just doesn't get preserved. But here in this very rapid depositional setting, um, it preserved. And so I think this is a valuable lesson to us in terms of what we expect to find and what we do find and how to interpret what we find uh, in terms of these small transitory kills. OK. Um, so each kill site is really a miracle of preservation. And each kill site is a unique combination of landscape and activities that leaves a signature in the bone bed. Uh, the bone bed isn't just a jumble of hundreds of bones. It's uh, eminently understandable and interpretable. Uh, well, in the late 1990s, I had an early midlife crisis and decided to go back to the University of Calgary for my PhD. It's a, a bit unusual to have a 15-year gap between doing your degrees and to do them in the same university. And I found it quite a surreal experience in terms of how much things had changed. In the 80s, we had had a lot of confidence in the methods and the theory underpinning um, the, the, the need and the reason for doing site-specific archaeology and the types of analysis that we did. Uh, what I found is in the post-processual world at the turn of the millennium, things were quite different. Uh, a lot of scholars were critiquing uh, the truths of the processual archaeologists um, some argued that the biases of the researchers resulted in colonial or ungendered interpretations. Uh, and there'd been a lot of change. People weren't doing the sorts of, the same types of site-specific analysis that, that I had been very familiar with in the 80s. Um, people had gotten a lot more scientific, so they were looking at stable isotopes in bone, and they were looking at DNA in bone. 
Um, they were looking at phytoliths and starch grains and, and much more scientific. Um, and then you had people that were looking at the big picture, the broader issues with GIS analysis and all that sort of thing. And that sort of site-specific middle, um, middle range, uh, the thing that, that interested me most, the middle range theory, um, tools that would give meaning to your observations was less and less popular in those days. And so uh, it was a bit of a shock to see. Now there's some really interesting stuff coming out, like we're all uh, sort of blown away by a lot of this stuff, the DNA and the isotopes and all of that stuff. Um, so it's good, um, but for a consultant, so somebody that does interpret site for their bread and butter, it's a little bit more difficult because you're looking for tools that will help you do a site-specific interpretation. And these people are doing science that requires, you know, labs and microscopes and stuff to do. So, so there had been a real change in archaeology over that period. Um, There's some really useful things. Uh, so some of these studies had pointed out real deficiencies in how we'd been doing our analysis. Uh, Trevor Peck's study of mandibles, where he did thin sectioning and compared the results, um, showed that we hadn't been applying some of our methods carefully enough or that they weren't as accurate as we thought they were. So this was really useful, uh, the critique uh, is always useful in science and that's how it works. You, you learn things, you critique, you learn more. Um, so that was, that was useful. Um, one really positive thing I think that's happened over the past 15 years in kill sites archaeology is how much better we've gotten at finding specific types of kill sites. Um, for example, the bison pound. Uh, when I did that work at the Smythe site, there was almost no bison pounds in Alberta that I could kind of compare, you know, looking at the size of the corral or the, any of that stuff to. Uh, in the last 10 or 15 years, we've had a real explosion uh, in finding bison pound sites in the province. Um, bison historical, Tom Head, the 111 site, uh, the work BB has done at Pascapu Slopes, uh, Sean Bubel at, at the University of Lethbridge, um, Fincastle, uh, the Bodo site, um, uh, Matt Moores from Stantec has been digging at Hardesty, the campsite mostly uh, next to the pound. So we're finding more and more of these sites. And so I'm really hopeful that we'll start to get back more and more into the types of um, analysis that can actually answer those sort of site-specific questions. Uh, I think that, that will be really good. And I think the pendulum is actually already starting to swing back that way. Uh, now, in terms of the future, um, I'm, I'm, I sort of had this talk about computers, and of course we're in this era now with computers. Um, as a consultant, we'll often find a bone in a bone bed and we'll think, huh, I wonder what kind of bone that is. And so I'm really looking forward to the day when uh, I can download the instructions for the 3D printer to print off my Wolverine uh, forelimb to compare my bone to the to the 3D plastic printed Wolverine bone and know that, okay, that's what I've got. Um, I'm really looking forward uh, to a future. Um, just as one example, uh, these are bison uh, humeri, or forelimbs, and they're fetal. And so this is one centimeter. And so there's a bison humerus, uh, about a centimeter long. So this is from a little tiny fetal bison about the size of a kitten. And then this is from a bison that's just about to be born. And we've always been interested in trying to figure out when you find a fetal bison bone, what season of the year it is. What, you know, when was this bison fetus obtained? And throughout, um, there's been people working on it. Dale Waldy has done discriminant function analysis and John Brumley did some things. Um, but basically they've always used a kind of a, a linear model assuming that a fetus grows at a at a regular rate when we know, and as Dale pointed out, we know that it's kind of not true that they grow herky-jerky, but um, we haven't really been able to uh, figure out fetal bone analysis that well with bison. Um, I've always been frustrated and I think, why doesn't somebody do this? But the reason why is it's very, very time consuming to go and try to get a bunch of bison fetuses, <laughs> all killed at different times of the year, and boil them all up, and then measure their bones, and then come out with a manual that uh, people can use. But I think with, um, uh, with, the, with the internet, the advent of the internet and big data, uh, you can imagine that there's bison fetuses sitting around in collections all over North America. And you know, you can use, I think faunal analysts are kind of need to use big data to actually get these big data sets together to do more in the future. 
um, with these very specific research problems that can be uh, useful. Um, and then who the heck doesn't want an app to do MNIs on their iPhone because you wouldn't have to do Sudoku standing in the bank lineup. You could download uh, John Brumley's um, butchering units and have your app and do MNIs that way. So uh, I, I think for faunal analysis and for the analysis of kill sites in general, um, the pendulum is swinging back this other way where we should be getting some really interesting tools that we can use to analyze our sites um, more in the future. And that's that. <laughs>